you know, it's really big, lots of resources at my disposal. Uh, am I really being true to, you know, the industry's problems? Uh, because obviously, even a big company, you see things from a different standpoint, and I'm talking to you guys about how to increase the odds of making commercial success and all that stuff. Uh, so that was my number one concern, right? I am going to talk about a few things which, you sh which should serve as construction blocks to craft successes in the games industry. Uh, but the problems and challenges of small developers, I'm, I'm well aware of them having been on the other side, right? And this presentation downstairs um, really energized me because you know, here was a guy who was operating out of IIIT and he chanced upon an accidental hit, right? Or what, what he would definitely consider a hit or what many indie developers would consider to be a hit. And then the, the, the thought in my mind was, if that were to happen to you as a game developer, are you actually prepared to deal with that kind of uh, influx of users? And if you're not prepared, and if you start preparing for it after you get that accidental you know, wave of, of users coming in, uh, that's a wrong time, right? So as they say in, in football parlance, uh, in a 90-minute match, the ball is with you for less than a minute in aggregate. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, Maradona or Messi or, or whatever, it could be two minutes. But the fact of the matter is no player has got the ball for 90 minutes. But all the practice, all the work that they do is uh, to basically tell you what you're supposed to do in those few seconds when you do have the ball, right? So same thing with game production. Uh, it's always good to tune yourself and train yourself into you know, what those best practices are. So on my right, titles that I'm inspired with, uh, try to be impartial. Uh, not all of them are from the company that I work in, uh, although some of them are. And then you know, there's one common thread running uh, amongst all these titles, uh, except maybe one or two. It's, it's how long they've been around, right? And, and all of them have got great production values, and, and they're really good and fun to play with. Uh, but many of them have sort of stood the test of time, and that's really something that's important to me. And there's others also from this, like this one doesn't have, you know, FIFA, it doesn't have uh, a lot of games that otherwise I've played and I really admire. Uh, and this presentation is not about how to buy a lottery ticket. So I love Flappy Bird, I've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, these are wildcard entries, and, you know, there's no way to engineer these hits. Uh, but if that's your model, you know, full respect, and you should definitely pursue that model. But what I'm talking about is not stuff where, like, Flappy Bird is a good game. There's a lot of such games in the market that don't even get a tenth of what they did in terms of momentum. Uh, there's a lot of other factors that went into making Flappy Bird, you know, what it was. Uh, but that's a different model, right? And the media industry is full of accidental hits. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun with this video these days. Uh, you know, of the 155 million views, I'm sure I've contributed to at least 25, 30 with, you know, my 11-year-old son and uh, my friends. We've had a lot of fun. You cannot engineer these hits. Something needs to happen. Justin Bieber needs to tweet about it. Uh, so, so these are accidental hits, and uh, it doesn't mean you stop trying for those. But again, like I said, that's not the focus of, of my presentation. There's also a, uh, a game based on pen, pineapple, and apple, and uh, it's, it's fun to play. I played it for all of two minutes, and not sure I'm going to play it again, but it's just a good reference point. Uh, so a little bit about me, I head uh, Slingshot Studios, which is part of EA Mobile, which is part of EA, great company, I've been there for nine years. Uh, we worked on a whole lot of titles from feature phone to social games, uh, and now we're responsible for a portfolio of freemium games uh, that some of you in this room uh, are well aware of. Um, and then by that, I mean the, right from the creative to design to strategy to sort of execution. Uh, what we're responsible for is an audience size that can fill up 26 full capacity Eden Garden stadiums, or legal full capacity Eden Garden stadiums. I don't know what they do in political rallies and stuff like that. So that's clearly a large audience base. So we try and make sure we're not dropping too many catches, and we try and take our ones and twos and you know the occasional boundary. Uh, it's 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 serious business, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's other things that lead to success in the games industry. I'm only talking about production, uh, but there's team competencies and behaviors. I think that's a number one thing, uh, and there's a few other presentations, I think today and tomorrow, which talk about that. Uh, so definitely go and attend those. Uh, there's also marketing, PR, and, and some of it is, I think, truncated. There's a whole lifetime value minus you know, cost per install arbitrage, which is a science in itself, hugely important. Uh, but it's got a lot of focus from mainstream media, and you know, almost everyone starts actually ends up talking more about business and strategy. So I'm going to focus today mostly on production for deep player engagement. 
Uh, quick word on the ecosystem. Uh, so $35 billion in revenue is what mobile is likely to land. That kind of makes it more than console and PC, but those numbers don't matter in this forum right now. Uh, there's a lot of emergence of specialized partners, which is great, because earlier you had to build everything yourself, and now you can save time to market by uh, partnering with the right uh, folks. Uh, consumers, spoiled for choice. Uh, there's a lot of things that are eating away, uh, chipping away at the game time that consumers spend. It's, you know, they call it the information economy. I think it's moving to an attention economy right now, where attention from consumers is really valuable. Right? Uh, hardware is fragmented. Uh, but at the same time getting better. And app stores, depending on which report you believe, there's either a million games or two million games. I think it means the same in the larger context. Uh, about 800 to 1,000 games getting added every day. So discovery and installs is, is still an issue. Uh, this business is, you know, huge payouts if you win. Uh, but 35% of uh, game developers make less than $100 a month. Uh, so that's definitely a challenge. That's also a reflection of how many people are making games. Um, so it seems like a winner-takes-all market, but then AppAnnie came out with a report that talked about a certain index which says that the spread of uh, money is actually getting better. Now, whether that's visible in your day-to-day -day, you know, functioning, it's, it's, it's hard to say. So what can we do? Um, I thought of 15 things you can do, and then I trimmed it down to eight, and I felt eight is too little. So I said 11. So I've got a list of 11. There's some omissions. You don't find quality out here, for example. But quality is just so obvious. I've broken down quality into a number of parameters. And you know, if you can take away some of these and, like I said, look at them on a day-to-day -day basis as you produce uh, content, uh, then it sort of gives you a nice heads-up display to make sure you're telling yourself that you're checking all these boxes. Or even if you cannot afford to do all of these things today, uh, you need to have the vision, right? So you might be a, a, an indie developer who says that, look, I've, I've got a four-member team. There's no way I can do all of these because they're expensive and they might be beyond reach. Uh, but what you need is a vision. Like, what would you do if you get a million installs? What would you do if someone really famous tweets about your game and you actually did get the kind of momentum that you've always hoped for, right? So you cannot, you cannot build those habits at that point. So uh, the first one is fun. Uh, which is very simply pursuit of a goal leading to accomplishment and then the reward and celebration, right? But because we're talking about games and not, a, not other forms of media, there's always challenges and constraints thrown in, uh, the standard game design stuff. But there's also clarity around what's the reward, what's at stake, you know, what are my tools that I'm going to be able to work with. Uh, end goal being you absorb the consumer and it's an immersive experience. Uh, using mechanics and controls and all that stuff, right? So there's no point talking about fun. Let's look at fun. Who remembers this? Who else? <laughs> okay. What what game is this? Uh, paper Perfect. Yeah. So I had a lot of fun, not just with tossing paper, but tossing watermelons at the guy sitting behind that desk. It's just you discover your own ways of having fun, right? This is amazing. Like hours and hours of fun in aggregate, and Things were just taking off in the smartphone domain, right? So this was one of those few titles which actually didn't have a virtual D-pad, you know, a direct lift off from you know other forms of, of media. It was actually built true to the platform. So it was a lot of fun Twitch-based gameplay. Uh, who remembers this? All right, fruit ninja. fruit ninja, perfect. So again, you know, this beautiful swipe and squishy fruits, which uh, really make you feel gratified about what you're doing, right? So this is all fun on a second-to-second -second basis. And uh, I'm sorry, the screen is a bit smaller than I expected it to be, so I don't know if it's visible right at the end. Who knows this game? This is trending these days. It's uh, Slither. Uh, you play a lot of games. Yeah, it's a beautiful game. Uh, lots of people are playing it. It's just you know the simplicity of it. So what's happening here? Uh, your job in this game is to it's a bit like Spore if you've played Spore, right? So gobble up snakes, smaller snakes, get bigger, and gobble up you know, bigger snakes than you were gobbling up. It's as simple as that. And one of the strategies in this game, or tactics rather, is to coil around smaller snakes, you know, get that radius to go uh, as small as you can, and then the head of the smaller snake actually touches the boundaries, collision detection, and that snake turns into mass, which you can go and eat up and increase your size. As simple as that, right? Look what happens. Now, this guy made a blunder, right? He should have just coiled around carefully, and then he started getting greedy or you know, speeding up the game. 
And then all of a sudden, there's a maneuver. The red snake actually whizzes past the guy's head, and then bam, the big snake is gone, right? I've seen my son do this like 10 times a day. Uh, so once a big snake is killed, you can actually go and eat up the mass, and then you get, you get bigger, right? Uh, hours and hours of endless fun. It's beautiful. Like, you can't define fun more than that particular moment when you've managed you know, what seems like the impossible thing to do. A uh, lot of fun. This is my game in, in session, and I'm just you know, so happy. I've got so many options. I've got the witch here. I've got Valkyrie about to destroy this guy. And I've got a rocket which I can just fire. So you know, it's that, that, that feeling of I am going to win irrespective of what happens. How many of you have played this game? OK, quite a lot. Uh, I've got a video which I can skip. But the next item, apart from fun, is longevity, right? So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this image before. Who knows when this was launched? This iconic piece of uh, music, pop culture, whatever. This is Dark Side of the Moon, launched in 1973. Still selling like hotcakes, right? We take inspiration from not just games, but also from other forms of media. Uh, average time to maturity is getting shorter. Again, this is all on App Annie. Um, you should go and look up, look up what that means. Uh, we've got to move from install dependent approach, which cannot sustain growth, to one which actually uh, takes advantage of the players that you have and drives more sessions from them. And then once you get to that sweet spot, every install that you get in aggregate is adding to something. Uh, you know, this, this is a business that's built from stolen moments. You might have heard this in, you know, in different talks. Uh, longevity is about making those stolen moments count towards a, a bigger purpose. So, you know, you've got five, six sessions, and if that's all the game is about, it'll, it'll fade, right? How do you make those five, six sessions count to, in aggregate, to something bigger? And then, you know, a week-long play to sort of get bigger and lead to a, a meta goal a month or, you know, a year down the line. Uh, and there's a lot of tricks you can do for this. There's events, there's quests, and all that stuff. So that's about longevity. If there's one or two things you remember from my presentation today, this would be one of the key things. Like everybody knows fun, but longevity is a difficult thing to focus on. Uh, let's look at some of the questions you need to ask yourself. So is my game experience evolving over time? Uh, what's the goal variety? Is there enough of discovery? Right? Plants vs. Zombies, fantastic game. Every new level, you had new stuff coming in, and you just couldn't wait to have it all. Right. Um, and then get more sophisticated about uh, measuring longevity, right? It's, it's more than just your day two through to day 90. It's about what is the quality of the session? What are people doing? How fast are they progressing? How, you know, are they stuck at a certain level? Those are kind of things to look at from a deep perspective. And along with that, is my game going to be able to scale vertically and, and horizontally from the tech and server perspective, and also from the, the user, the player journey perspective? Uh, another great example of uh, sort of breaking it down is Clash Royale. Uh, the first stage is learning. We are sort of getting to know your units. Uh, you play without a strategy, but then you know the game is forgiving. It helps you learn. Uh, by the time you're in day seven, you start experimenting. You, know, you start using more units, even if you fail. Right? A lot of times it doesn't make sense. You like I've. Sometimes packed in a lot of range attacks, thinking that I'll you know, have a pure offensive strategy. It doesn't really work. Uh, and then you get into deep discovery. My range is kind of the 1,700 to 2,300 range. I keep going up, you know, toggling up and down uh, based on how much attention I'm paying to the game. Uh, but then they also introduce tournaments in day 30. Uh, and then day 90 onwards, you know, you've got the legendary arena, which is, it really gets tough as you keep going forward. right? So there's a bit of sawtooth difficulty in the earlier levels. Uh, around the time when you reach tournaments, you pretty much know that you need to either be spending a lot or you know drive a lot of uh, engagement to actually or, or sessions to actually try and win. Um, so there's a lot of players uh, in my office who are far more accomplished, and you know, really like to thank uh, them for actually building this slide. But this is, I think, an example of a game uh, that's really evolving, uh, and it's allowing the players to evolve along with it, right? Another game which um, you know, I'm very close to, because my studio handles it, is Tetris Blitz. If you look at uh, over the years what this game has done, it started off with single player. And then you know, 2014, there was a competitive style of play introduced in tournaments. Uh, we did one-on-one -on -one battles in 2015. And, and here we are in 2016 with you know, complete UX refresh, uh, along with daily challenges. Uh, so that tells the player, that sends a message that you know, you're not going to get stuck in one level. 
uh, or stuck at the point where you are. Uh, the game really recognizes your need to sort of see more advancement uh, within that. And these are tough things to do because players have formed rituals and habits around what they do. So you're offering new experiences, um, you know, so that they can uh, advance in the game. But at the same time, you need to preserve what, what they hold dear to them. Uh, separating tactics from strategy, uh, a lot of this is from, I think it's from Asphalt, uh, a daily bonus kind of a mechanic, which incentivizes people to come to the game every day, but that's very transactional. So you cannot build a business purely based on that. Same thing with push notes. Extremely important tools to use uh, in a game, uh, but you can't build a business out of just having that. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. So understanding audience diversity, right? Traditional business thinking was you build a game, you go and put it in front of Google and Apple, get an audience from them, and you get volumes of users coming in, and then you make money. Uh, in reality, what happens is you get a you know, diverse set of audience coming into your game. And if you're trying to make money without uh, acknowledging the diversity, uh, then you're basically missing the point. Because they play differently, they spend differently, uh, they engage with your game in, in different manners, right? Some prefer skill, other pr others prefer chance. So just getting a grip on, on, on who these players are and what they're doing. Uh, there's any number of ways of classifying your players. I'm trying to stay away from the terminology that we use in the company because that's proprietary. But you know, broadly speaking, they could be ultra competitive, highly social, uh, those who value me time, and then those casual wanderers who you know, use free Wi-Fi, download a bunch of games, they don't even know what they've downloaded and you know, incidentally stumble upon a game that either sticks or then they end up deleting. So there's all kinds of, of players, uh, you know, in large part because games are free. So you're not really trying to justify a purchase. Um, where you invest uh, is, is, a, is a very critical decision, right? If you start investing more in, in people who are not into skills and if you have, you know, hardcore uh, systems, uh, which are built around one-on-one -on -one, uh, competitive gameplay, then no matter what you do, it's, it's not going to work. So the sooner you figure out um, not just what you want to go after, but what kind of player base you have in the game, the more productive it's going to be for you. Elder player systems. I talk about longevity being one thing that you can take away from this presentation. The second one is about elder player systems. Again, you know, this is elder players it's a relative term. Sometimes it can be after three, four years of gameplay. Sometimes even after six months, you have people who sort of maxed out, and you can consider them veterans of your game. Uh, but this is essentially how players evolve, right? Uh, you've got a toddler on a bicycle, and then you know starts riding with friends, and ultimately might prefer co-op games because uh, Harley Davidson gangs are within a gang; they're not competing. It's more of a cooperative style, and then you can you know have some players who are more hardcore competitive. And then the third variety could be hardcore, highly skilled, but I compete against myself, right? So is this journey clear to us when we're building a game? Uh, otherwise, like I said, you uh, end up investing in features that uh, don't really matter. Um, how many of us have had multiple invitations to a party on a given day sometimes in life, right? Anyone who hasn't? So sometimes you end up going to the party where you know people, right? Uh, so the social... Uh, draw is actually a big factor. Uh, what happens here is that there's bright and shiny games getting installed every day, uh, getting uh, launched every day. Uh, so if you don't have the right social hooks, uh, people will move out and, and you know sample those new games, and, uh, sometimes at, at the cost of deleting your game. Uh, so again, you know some examples of how you have a casual pick up and play experience, and then it evolves over a period of time into a tournament uh, system. And from there, it's about mastery. So there's some players who care about this progression, which is, am I getting better, you know, right from proficient to seasoned to adept to skilled. Um, and then this is sort of the single player mode in Tetris Blitz, where it's, it's the most casual pick up and play experience. And we're constantly looking at you know, what proportion of players uh, uh, are engaging with this mode versus this and, and this. because. Uh, we have different offerings in, in each of these modes, uh, and it's really important for us to measure what people are, are accepting as we sort of offer them these experiences. Uh, there's also fantastic graphs and, and you know, pie charts and models that you can use uh, if you really care about this enough. And at some point, uh, it just gives you a good dashboard to say, uh, you know, am I investing in, in the right, to solve the right problem, right? So this 
Graph, for instance, talks about you know, level 0 to 40, I've got 60% of my player base. Uh, 41 through to 100 has got 30% of my player base. And then onwards, that, that's sort of the elder player uh, group. Uh, where are my investments compared to where these players are, right? And, and what are these players doing at, at, at these various slabs? Of gameplay, and you, it could, it could, you know, even be the reverse, where there are some games which have uh, uh, fewer installs, so most of the players get pushed back to higher levels, and then they start playing in a slightly different manner. Uh, so just getting this uh, uh, picture uh, of your game really helps in terms of uh, charting out that growth process. Uh, community management. So I'm not going to talk too much about this. There's a, a talk from Abhishek, I think it's tomorrow, uh, and that's going to be more comprehensive, but uh, the only thing I'll leave you guys with is that extremely important. Uh, games are built around communities. Sometimes a community and the game get so intertwined that you know, for a player it's the same. It feels like a family. Uh, give them a, a place to express themselves. Uh, you get a lot of inputs from the community uh, in terms of features or stuff that you might have overlooked. Uh, form champions within that have a help section even if it's rudimentary. It doesn't have to be the most uh, uh, polished, keyword-based section as long as people are able to find what they need. Uh, and then the ultimate thing is made. It doesn't mean that every game has to be low file size. It's just a trade-off between the value I'm offering uh, versus what I'm asking you to, asking the player to uh, invest. From the game team uh, side, and, and we've learned this, you know, sometimes the hard way and sometimes uh, to our benefit, you know, it's got to have great libraries, tools, and editors, but at the same time, downloadable content, you know, provisions so that you're able to push content through the server without having to wait, you know, for Apple's ap approval process and so on and so forth. Um, network tolerance is a big deal, health monitoring, you know, having Crashlytics integrated. All these are sometimes afterthoughts. It's really, really difficult to preempt all this, uh, but you know I'm here to share experiences. So if you guys can push that into your development pipeline from the beginning, then it just pays out dividends very quickly. Product management. Okay, this is basically the life of a product manager. And before I talk about product management, let me just explain to you what I mean by product management. So, what do we want players to do in a game? We want players to find the game to install the game, to open it after they've installed it, to learn how the game functions, which is basically the tutorial, um, to basically log in with their Facebook IDs so that you can save progress and you can identify the player and reach out in case she has a problem. We want players to visit the store. We want them to sample content. We want them to buy. Uh, we want them to come back again. We want them to get their friends. That's what we as a game team want players to do. Uh, the measurement for whether the players are doing this or not is, is what the product manager or the, or the analyst does. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, the data that you end up getting uh, is too much. It's more than you can consume, right? And sometimes that water that's flowing through that pipe is really dirty, so you don't know whether to trust that data or not, right? Um, but that it is what it is, and uh, I think the faster you can pull out that data, react to it, you know, make that data work into actually improving your experience, the better you will be as a game team. Um, you know, it's extremely critical uh, to also make sure that you've got a tie-in with real-world events. Uh, that's a graph of, uh, it's a publicly available graph. The revenues actually went up by, you know, more than 50%, right? Uh, so the story doesn't begin and end with what, what happened with Pokemon Go. The story is really about having a calendar, and I said international audience, right? So you've got to be aware of what moves the needle uh, in the regions that you care about. Just making sure that you know whether it's Halloween or Thanksgiving or Fourth of July, you will see a certain uh, additional traction in terms of your game. Uh, that's also something that falls in, you know, it falls as a responsibility of the entire team, but the product manager can actually lead this. Uh, just breaking down the product manager's role into you know components, and there's a lot more than this. Uh, but some of you will find this useful, and, and this is sort of if if you can do, even do this much, that, I think that's a big step up. So strategy, feature evaluation, economy, uh, supporting experiments, reporting and analysis, driving engagement, and monetization. Right. So that's 
it, the product manager basically brings in that that balance between left brain and right brain in in, in the team. If you have one person who can who can do both design and product management, that's fine as long as uh, the person works two shifts. Uh, but it is a full time job, and uh, you know you're you're driving high level strategy on one end, and then specific tactics on the other. So you've got to be able to toggle between you know, uh, this journey fairly quickly. Uh, supporting experiments is an example I can call out. So, you know, whether it's pricing or feature adoption, uh, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no way of knowing how players will react, right? The only thing you can do is you can experiment and learn and then fine tune your, your offering uh, and then settle down on, on the right pricing. Uh, this is a big slide. Uh, I don't think it's visible from the end out there, but I, you don't need to read everything. And if you guys are really interested, I'm happy to share this with you. Uh, I talked about leveraging the ecosystem. So if you look at, uh, you know, on, on this column, you, it's all the functionalities that you need in a game. And on the right column, there's a bunch of partners who can provide you, uh, you know, support and help for those functionalities. Um, sometimes on a revenue share, sometimes on a fixed fee basis. So. Always take advantage of this ecosystem. It's taken a few years to actually get to this point, and it's getting better. So for example, in-game messaging, right? Extremely critical. Uh, you have to be able to communicate to players while they're playing the game, either contextually, if you find that consumers or uh, players are not doing what you intended uh, for them to do, or if you have something new that's coming up and you want to build anticipation, you want to build excitement. Um, that's in-game messaging, and you know we've used Play Heaven. Uh, there's a few other companies that actually allow you to do that. Uh, another example would be A-B testing. Uh, we've used that in some games. Uh, and I think the, the tool that we used was Swerve. Uh, likewise, there's a whole lot of partners in terms of App Store optimization, is making sure you've got your keywords right, your, your messaging right, your merchandising right on the App Store. Um, In-game ads. So this conversation is about production. I'm not going to talk about how to optimized, but I do want to talk about uh, what's happening with in-game ads from a user experience standpoint. I think it's, it's beyond uh, any kind of uh, debate right now that display ads are not the most efficient in terms of the aesthetic sensibilities, right? So a banner is going to be intrusive uh, to a game, and it drives a lot of revenue, so I, I get why games have got banners. Uh, but video is taking off in a big way. And this is an example on the right of uh, a game called Doomsday Clicker, uh, which I think is, is probably setting a, a kind of benchmark, at least as far as I've seen, you know, in terms of how ad opportunities are surfaced. You know, the timing at which it asks uh, a player or offers a player to watch an ad. Uh, it's right up front. It feels part of the game, which is really beautiful. Uh, and there's a very, very clear value proposition, right? So. Check out Doomsday Clicker, and I think this is uh, increasingly going to be a trend. Uh, I know somewhere in NASCOM this year, there's folks from Green a couple of weeks ago, they are trying to push through with native ads, uh, for instance. So, you know, as simple as a sports game with a stadium, and they'll actually, uh, you know, try and monetize the panels uh, within the arena. So that's, you know, it's, it's hard to scale that, but these are the emerging things you find in, in the ad funded, uh, in the ad space. Uh, which you should definitely try and look at. Uh, and then feel free to try and, and make modifications to the game to actually support ads. I mean, this is not uncommon in sports, right? Uh, why do you have strategic timeouts in IPL? Uh, it's not like test matches don't have strategy, right? But some of these things are modified and designed for ads. Uh, without overdoing it, one needs to uh, you know, find the right balance. Uh, again, examples of how you can have consumer opt-in ad system, so a daily free spin. You know, after you're done with your spin, you can actually activate another one. Or I've scored a million here, and I need to score 1.2 million to actually clear the first level. So either spend coins or, or watch an ad. Uh, and then those last two screens, again, are from Doomsday Clicker, which uh, I think is a really, really polished experience. Uh, second last item on my list is art and UI. Uh, I thought I'd separate these out into two distinct components just because uh, art is a big field in itself and, and so is UI. Uh, but for the purpose of brevity uh, and because I'm leaving you guys with broad topics that you can go and you know, research out at, at your own discretion, um, the main question to ask yourself is, is do, does the game have a distinct visual uh, style 
or does it feel like six different artists are doing, you know, are pulling the carriage in different ways, right? Very, very important to actually lay down uh, the rules and, and the sort of uh, template uh, and, and the palette. Uh, otherwise, you know, like most games, you end up uh, sort of getting confused. The splash screen is a realistic castle. You get into the main, you know, menu. It's got those, those cartoony forms of, you know, cartoon rendered images of a castle. And you're not really sure whether this is a, a sort of casual game or a core game. And you see a lot of examples in the app store of, of this kind. So just having that consistency. Um, is, is sort of the, the basic. And on the UI side, there's so many things, right? There's information design, there's navigation, there's store. Uh, is the store just a list of things, or is it actually inspiring people to you know, go ahead and try something out? Um, and along with that is messaging, tone, tenor, frequency. Like, does the game really have a consistent form of, of messaging? Uh, lots of examples here of games which uh, you know, we feel have done it right. Uh, on the extreme left is Unravel. Uh, you know, beautiful blurred, muted sort of backgrounds, which make the actual character pop. So it's very clear, you know, who the main hero of the screen is, right? Seems like a linear checklist, right? It's it's more of a philosophy. Like, am I conscious about polish? Am I conscious about art? It doesn't mean that on Thursday I'm going to sit and clean up everything to do with art, and on Friday I'm going to sit and do product management only. Uh, I, I think this is all. You know, concurrent, there's a bit of concurrency out here. Uh, the biggest challenge is in developing those features. Uh, they can be very expensive. OK, so we talked about need for speed. Uh, cultural nuance is hugely important. Uh, and this is easier now than it used to be 10, 15 years ago, just because we've got so much reference material today online. Uh, earlier in console outsourcing, clients would you know send you gigabytes of uh, actually megabytes of reference images those days, which used to look big. Uh, today you've got you know Google, YouTube. You, if you need a, a Scandinavian kitchen, you can go and get references easier easily. Otherwise, you'd have to go to British, British Library and look at some architecture magazines and you know <laughs> build according to that. But today it's it's way more easy to get reference images and. Even then, you find instances where uh, game developers don't do this, right? So just making sure uh, you know what a farmer looks like in India versus, let's say, in Europe versus the US. And, and uh, that's, that's at a very basic level. Uh, mood boards and tonal values. Uh, this, we've got live experience working on this, with, where we had a game which felt a bit too dark for the audience that it was targeting. And we spent close to a year in changing not just the art scheme, but also the, the UI and, and you know, the overall user experience on this. We went through a lot of options, right? So the mood board on the extreme right on top is one which is casual, bright. Uh, and then we were worried about whether players will see that as too much of a radical change, right? So players also have separation anxiety if they've been playing a game for a year or, or two. Uh, they don't want to suddenly launch the game and find that it's turned into Candy Crush. Uh, that, that's not the way to do it. So we stayed away from taking a very radical approach. We kind of settled for something that retained the core essence of, of what the game was about, uh, added better contrast, and made it a bit more light in terms of cognitive overload. Uh, similar examples here. The image on the right is it's a beautiful image. Unfortunately, uh, it's got everything screaming for attention and prominence. Right? And if you look at the HUD, it's sort of floating in the air. You don't know what to focus on. You don't know who the main hero of that uh, image is. So again, a, a great example of something that's beautifully done. And maybe they outsourced the HUD to some you know, art company, and, and maybe the terrain was done by someone else. When you put it together, it just doesn't have the same uh, you know, feeling that you would get in a game that was uh, thought through properly. Just being sensitive towards all this. Uh, examples from Tetris. OK, I talked about messaging, and I talked about UI. Uh, there's any number of ways of asking people to log into Facebook. You know, one of the most commonly used ways is I give you 10,000 coins, log into Facebook. Like, why? Why should I do it as a consumer? Right? This is an example of calling it out. Here's why. A uh, few months ago, I broke my phone. Uh, OK, I want to be honest with you guys. I sat on my phone and broke it. 
I had the phone in my rear pocket and I sat in the car. And as I was handing it over for repair, um, you know, my number one thought was that I had played through about 20 hours of a particular game without logging into Facebook, deliberately because I wanted to see when the game starts uh, reminding me to log in and all that stuff. So I had no social identifier in that game. I had lost all my progress. I didn't care about uh, emails, they were protected. I didn't care about pictures because they're all in the cloud. But I did care about the 20 odd hours I'd spent playing this game. And, and there was every likelihood I would never see uh, my phone restored to the same uh, you know, uh, state that it was in. Um, you've got to put that out there. Not about, you know, be careful, don't break your phone without signing in, but some kind of message that says, uh, here's why you should log into Facebook, right? Be clear about it, be upfront, and give coins. So that's sort of a messaging strategy. Another example is from Tetris. So this is a beautiful implementation. You guys should download it and, and play. So after you finish a game, there's something called a finisher that can boost your score. And uh, you don't have forever to take a decision. You know, there's that green bar that sort of is, is reducing. So uh, it's offering value, but it's also uh, you know, staying true to the, uh, and staying consistent to the excitement and frenzy that game creates, right? Because you've got, you've got to take a quick decision about it. Uh, the last item I have is that of polish. Uh, polish is not about visuals, right? Big misconception. Uh, polish is about the overall experience. It's about the game developer caring for the craft, uh, caring for the overall experience. And everything else gets in the way of polish, right? You, you set some time aside for polish towards the end of a project, and you invariably eat up that time for something else. And the only way to do it is to do it continuously, right? Uh, not leaving things for the polish stage to the extent possible. Uh, and I do want to talk about polish in, in greater detail, so you know, the way your rewards and celebrations are working, uh, the way your messaging is, uh, is, is working, the way your error handling is set up. Uh, you, you're driving, uh, you know, you're being driven to uh, your house or you're in a bus, you're playing the game and, and the network obviously toggles from tar to tar and is your game able to handle those, those switches seamlessly? Uh, type of particle effects, sound, visual effects, navigational dead ends, like big no-no. Uh, tweening, animation polish, bugs, you know, fairly obvious. Uh, for the FTUE stands for first time user experience, for those new to this term. Uh, just making sure that, uh, don't assume anything. Don't assume that people will easily understand what uh, you're trying to tell them, which is kind of difficult because, you know, for example, there's about 200 endless runners now. There's a lot of game literacy. People know that swiping up means jump and, and you know, swiping down means going under that tree trunk or whatever. Uh, so you can't overdo it also because there's a certain baseline game literacy that's already there. Uh, but that's where, you know, your discretion comes in in terms of uh, are you contextually able to uh, illustrate what you mean to different kinds of people? Uh, you know, no room for text truncations, look at copy, indentation, uh, all that is sort of basic stuff. Uh, an international audience or any audience that is discerning will try to make up their mind in 30 seconds about whether you're worth the investment or not. Right? They'll size up your game uh, in about 30 seconds, maybe a minute, uh, to do two things. One is, is this from a credible developer, number one? Number two, does this have depth uh, in gameplay? So it has to be fun, yes. That's why I'm going to spend two minutes in the first place. Uh, but is it all going to add up to something, right? Uh, and I, am I going to get better? Am I going to be able to play this with my friends and stuff like that? That's where polish comes in. So it doesn't matter how good your feature is. Uh, if you don't have polish, if it doesn't inspire players, nobody is going to, you know, that feature is just not going to work. And the last thing is polish is culture and attitude. It's not about process, right? Uh, the left side, uh, the image on the left was taken at the beautiful airport that we have, which is, you know, in all fairness, it's, it's amazing. It's hugely functional. I don't know why they had to stick a paper here to say that the lift isn't that, to ask me not to press this button. You know, there's cello tape out there. And like, like, surely you've got to be prepared for that, those kind of eventualities, right? Yeah, so it's an attitude. Uh, functionally, it does the job. It tells people not to press that button. But you've got a beautiful airport. And why are you messing it up with this kind of stuff, right? Same thing happens in apps and games every single day. Uh, image on the right is a, you know, it's a hotel which shouldn't really be doing this, and 
you call an electrician, he'll say, it's working, it's fine, but it's not, right? It's, it's not aligned. So this is not something that you can, uh, you know, you can't put a JIRA ticket for this. Uh, you cannot have it as part of your dev checklist and all that. Like, this is, don't screw up, right? This is as basic as that. Uh, so the, you know, more you get this ingrained in your culture and in your attitude, the, the faster it will be, and this will no longer even become a factor that you have to look, look at twice, right? And, uh, you know, I, th I think I was watching a video a few months ago from the uh, founder of Oyo, right? And he was comparing his business to that of a taxi uh, hailing business. And he said the, uh, the margin for error in a taxi business is very low. Like, the driver has to reach on time and then take you from point A to point B. Uh, and in the hotel business, it's manifold. So many things can go wrong, right, uh, during the course of the guest staying over there. And I think if you look at games, there's so many things that can go right. There's a lot of things that can go well. Uh, there's so many things that can go wrong, sorry. And uh, that's why I said it's a tough business at the beginning, right? Uh, but it's also a lot of fun. If you get it right, it's very gratifying. Uh, but if you can minimize, uh, you know, instances of, uh, you know, either bad feature design, wrong investments, over leverage on, you know, something that's not really going to matter to the game, on polish, uh, then I think that slowly starts, you know, paying dividends uh, going forward. So that's pretty much it. Eleven building blocks. Um, there's only ten on the visual. I couldn't find one with eleven. Um, but that's that's my uh, take on you know the essential sort of construction kit for driving success in games. Thank you.